Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about research design and what research design is and what the implications of research design are for the conclusions that we can draw from our research, as well as talking about experimental research designs, what the logic of experimentation is, so why we do experiments and what the conclusions we can draw from well-designed experiments are. We're going to start out by talking about comparisons as being key to our research designs and our ability to find causal relationships between variables. And then we're going to move on and talk specifically about experimental research designs. So we shouldn't underestimate the importance of good comparisons for doing research. Comparisons are really the backbone of inference. If a researcher wants to know if a particular drug is effective at curing an illness, the researcher compares a group of people who took the drug and a group of people who did not take the drug to see if they have different outcomes. That's the key comparison going on in that research. We've been talking about examples like whether attending Head Start affects a child's readiness for kindergarten. So in this case, we're comparing a group of kids who attended Head Start to a group of kids who did not to see if they have different outcomes. We can run into trouble when we make simple bivariate comparisons between groups without taking into account a lot of other complexity. We need to consider whether the groups that we're studying are really comparable to one another. So let's go back to considering this researcher who's conducting a drug trial. And let's imagine that everyone in the group of people taking the drug is also visiting their doctor every week, is also on a strict diet to help manage their illness, and is also taking a break from work to try to recover, so they're getting a lot of rest. And everyone in the group of people not taking the drug is not seeing their doctor frequently, they're not eating any differently than usual, they're not on this special diet, and they are still going to work every day, so they're working just as hard as usual. So if that's the case, then these two groups of people are systematically different from each other in a lot of ways. They're not just different because some of them are taking the drug and some of them aren't. They have these systematic differences. So if we did a simple comparison of the health outcomes of these two groups of people, we would come to misleading conclusions about how effective this drug is at curing their illness. This would be a bad comparison because these groups are not comparable to one another in a lot of ways. And if we make a faulty comparison, we're likely to come to bad and misleading conclusions about the causal relationship that we are interested in. So a colleague was telling me about uh, an advertisement that they saw that claimed that 90% of cold sufferers reported significant improvement after three days when using Vicks VapoRub. So Vicks VapoRub is this topical ointment with menthol in it that's supposed to sort of help relieve congestion and coughing and stuff like that. So what this advertisement is implicitly claiming is that Vicks VapoRub causes people's colds to improve. But the thing that we need to take into account as we examine this statement and consider it is that for most people, their colds only last a couple of days. So if you have a cold, chances are three days later, you're going to feel better. So if most people's colds improve after a few days, and most people say that their cold improved after a few days when using Vicks VapoRub, without a comparison group, without a group of people who didn't use Vicks VapoRub, we can't make any inference about whether there is a causal relationship between using this ointment and having uh, like an improved health outcome, uh, having your cold go away faster. So if we were going to try to find a causal relationship between these two things, we would need to make a comparison between people who use the product, Vicks VapoRub, and people who did not, and see if they had statistically significantly different outcomes when it came to how well they were feeling a couple of days later. So keeping this intuition about the importance of comparisons in mind, let's move on and talk about research design. So. When we are conducting research, we come armed with a theory about a particular independent variable x causing a dependent variable y. And a theory can be wrong or misleading. We don't know for sure that our theory is correct that x causes y in reality. And so we want to use data to test whether x causes y. 
But there are lots of different ways that we can go about testing this theory. There are different strategies or different research designs that we can use. What research designs have in common is their goal. Their goal is to answer this question about whether there is a relationship between X and Y as conclusively as possible. So there are a couple key components of a research design. The research design, again, is just a plan to answer your research question. So it includes a causal theory about X causing Y and implied hypotheses from that theory. So a hypothesis could be that when X increases, Y increases, or that when X increases, Y decreases. We also have a unit of analysis on which the hypotheses operate. So depending on what your theory is about and what your hypotheses are about, you're going to be talking about different units. So you might be theorizing about people, you might be theorizing about districts or states, you might be theorizing about countries, whatever you're theorizing about, whatever your units are, that's your unit of analysis. So if I have a theory about a person's age causing their likelihood of voting, then my unit of analysis is an individual, an individual person. If I have a theory about the regime type of a country causing that country's economic success, then my unit of analysis is a country. The next element of my research design is a set of variables that I'm going to be using. So this includes my dependent variable y and my independent variable x. It might also include a lot of the potential confounding variables that I want to control for, so variable z. These are all the variables that I want to collect data on. A big part of my research design is how I'm going to go about collecting the data I need to answer the question that I have about the relationship between these variables. And then I also am going to need a plan for how I'm going to analyze those data once I have collected them. So there are two main categories of research studies. They are experimental studies and observational studies. And we've talked about these a bit in the earlier part of this course. So experimental studies involve collecting a group of participants and conducting an experiment on them, whereas an observational study involves sort of going out into the world and collecting data about things that are just happening out in the world. So experimental studies are sort of seen as a benchmark or a gold standard of scientific research. And that has to do with how well they get us to causal inference, how well they get us over some of the causal hurdles that we've been talking about this week. So we're going to talk about the reasons for that a little bit later in this lecture as we dive a little bit deeper into the world of experimental studies. Observational studies also are trying to pursue the same goal of isolating relationships between the variables that we care about. But the approaches that we take when we do an observational study are different from the approaches we take when we do an experiment. The next lecture is going to be talking specifically about observational studies. So let's go ahead and look at an example. This example is going to be about advertising in elections. So let's consider this situation where you are a candidate for political office and you're in what you're pretty sure is a tight race with your competitor. And you're deciding whether or not to create an ad and air that ad on television. And that ad is going to sharply contrast your record with your opponents. So you're going to be talking about why your record is great and why your opponent's record is crap. And your campaign manager has this public relations firm create this ad for you and you get to see it in your strategy meetings and you think it's great, but you want to know fundamentally whether this ad is going to work with voters, whether when the voters see this ad, they're going to be more likely to vote for you than they were before. So in this situation, we can tease out an independent variable, which is a voter seeing this ad, and a dependent variable, that voter's likelihood of voting for you, this particular candidate running this ad. So this is a causal question, whether X, exposure to this negative ad, causes Y, a higher likelihood of voting for you. And this causal a relationship that we're interested in also has an important directional element to it. So we don't just want to know whether exposure to the ad changes the voters likelihood of voting for you. We want to know specifically if exposure to the ad increases the voters likelihood of voting for you. So let's talk about how we're going to go about evaluating this. 
let's start by thinking about what is the comparison that we want to make when we're answering this question. Well, the comparison is comparing the likelihood of a voter voting for you if they're in a group of people who have seen the ad versus a group of people who have not seen the ad. So that's the comparison we want to make, people who have seen the ad and people who have not seen the ad to evaluate that ad's effectiveness. So we have to keep in mind that voters vote for or against a candidate for lots of reasons. And those reasons are not going to be just whether they're exposed to this ad or not. There's going to be a lot of other stuff going on. For example, what party are you in and what party is the voter in? Or do you match up on some of these ideological elements that a voter is going to be concerned about? Do you have similar policies and policy preferences to the voter? Um, does the voter have particular socioeconomic characteristics or other characteristics of their personal life that are going to make them more or less likely to vote? So there are lots of these other possible confounding variables Z that we need to take into account uh, when we are doing this research. So how are we going to establish whether or not among all of these other confounding influences, the advertisement that you are thinking about running causes voters to be more likely to vote for you? Like we've been talking about, one of the really crucial elements of disentangling this relationship between variables is making sure that we're taking confounders into account. So for example, a third variable, Z, uh, like interest in politics might be confounding this relationship between exposure to a campaign ad and your likelihood of supporting that candidate. So a person who is more interested in politics generally might be more likely to turn out to vote and therefore more likely to support you just by virtue of being at the polls and able to vote for you. And that interest in politics might determine whether that person in the real world is exposed to your campaign ad. So if, for example, this person is watching TV, someone who is more interested in politics might be more likely to stay on that channel and watch the campaign ad, and someone who's less interested in politics might be more likely to mute it or to channel surf until their program is back on. So this confounding variable, interest in politics, might be correlated both with exposure to the campaign ad and to the likelihood of supporting you in this election. And so confounders like this are something that we really have to take into account when we are trying to find this relationship. So it turns out that experimental research strategies are really good at allowing us to take these confounding variables into account and prevent them from interfering with the conclusions that we come to about the relationship between our key independent and dependent variables. So before we go into talking about how we would apply an experimental research methodology to this particular case, let's just take a minute and talk about what experiments are. So an experiment is a research design where the researcher controls the values of the independent variable that each subject gets and randomly assigns subjects into those different categories. So for example, in a drug trial, a researcher controls who gets the drug and who does not and randomly assigns the subjects in that trial into the group that gets the drug and the group that doesn't. And these are the key features of an experiment, that the researcher has control over who gets this treatment or stimulus or something, who gets this particular value of an independent variable, and the researcher is able to randomly assign people into those different categories that the researcher is then going to end up comparing. So let's talk about these two key elements of experimental research design a little bit more. So the first of these was control. So what do we mean when we say that a researcher controls the value of the independent variable that the subjects get? Well, what we mean is that the values of the independent variable that the subjects receive are not determined by nature or by the subjects themselves. So subjects don't choose what value of the independent variable X they get. They don't choose in a drug trial whether they take the drug or not. They don't choose in your campaign ad example whether to watch the ad or not. In an experimental setup, researchers get to determine which of our subjects view the campaign ad and which of them don't. 
when subjects are allowed to choose values of independent variables for themselves, this means that underlying characteristics of those subjects that might uh, guide them one way or the other in which value of the independent variable they would like to have. Um, when the subjects are able to choose from themselves, those other characteristics come into play. But when the researcher controls who gets different values of the independent variable, all of those underlying characteristics don't matter to what value of the independent variable the subject gets. So what this does is it eliminates those characteristics from being confounders in this relationship that we're interested in. The other main element of the experimental methodology is random assignment. So researchers not only control the values of the independent variable that subjects get, but they also randomly assign those values to their subjects. So if we're doing an experiment about our campaign ad, what we would do is we would have a random process that determined whether a subject saw the ad or didn't see the ad. So something like drawing random numbers out of a hat or using a random number generator or flipping a coin or some other completely random mechanism to divide our subjects into a treatment group who will view the ad and a control group who won't. So we have these two groups that we want to compare, people who see the ad and people who don't see the ad. And in the real world, confounding variables influence how people sort themselves into these different groups. So depending on how interested a person is in politics, how predisposed a person is to vote for the candidate the ad is for, how free the time of the person is who's watching the ad, what, how likely the person is to be at home and watching TV, and things like that. Those are all factors that can influence how likely a person is to see the ad that can also influence how likely they are to go vote. In an experimental setting, when we control who sees the ad and randomly sort people into these groups who see the ad and don't see the ad, all of those other confounding factors go away. This means that we can make a valid comparison between these two groups. So our experimental setup in this case to answer this question about how effective this campaign ad is would be to collect a group of subjects, to randomly sort them into groups of people, and to have one of those groups watch the ad and another one of those groups uh, watch something else, something that is not related to the campaign, so like a, a commercial for something else. Um, that's like a placebo treatment where you want to make sure that both of the uh, groups don't know whether they're in the treatment or the control group, so they should both watch something. And then you're going to try and measure the outcome that you're interested in. So you could survey, survey those people after the election to see who they voted for, or probably you want to get a more immediate uh, measure of how effective that uh, that ad was. So probably more likely is you would expose the people to that treatment, uh, watching whatever they watched, and then you would survey them. And you would have one of those survey questions be about who they're most likely to vote for in the upcoming election. So let's recap why control and random assignment are so important. So we've been talking about how science is all about comparisons and how the outcome that we care about is influenced by all sorts of factors. And just to reiterate, random assignment means that when we compare the treatment and control groups, that comparison is as pure as we can make it. There are, we've tried to eliminate through this random assignment procedure, any systematic differences between the treatment and the control group. So this reduces the likelihood that there's some other variable that determines whether people are in the treatment or control group. So it determines whether people get a particular value of the independent variable. By removing that, uh, we sort of subtract away all of these confounders and we have a really good comparison between these two groups and to see how those groups differ on the outcome that we're interested in. So let's go back briefly to our causal hurdles framework and talk about how experiments affect our ability to pass each of those conditions for causal inference. 
um, what the particular benefits of the experimental research procedure are. So just to remind you, those causal hurdles are whether there's a credible causal mechanism, sort of a theoretical story connecting X and Y, whether we can rule out reverse causation, whether there's covariation between X and Y, and whether we've, we've, whether we've controlled for all of these confounding variables Z that might be influencing this relationship between X and Y. So the first hurdle is just a question of theory and whether we have a theoretically plausible causal mechanism isn't really affected by our experimental methodology. And the third of these causal hurdles is a question that is just answered by our data, whether there is a correlation between X and Y. So neither of those uh, causal hurdles is particularly affected by the experimental research methodology, but the second and fourth hurdles are. So the second is whether we can rule out the possibility that y causes x. So we're interested in x causing y. We're interested in an independent variable or a treatment causing a particular outcome. We want to make sure that the outcome doesn't affect the value of the independent variable. So in an experimental setting, uh, the outcome for a particular subject has no way of bearing on whether the subject gets a particular value of the independent variable. So the subject is randomly sorted into one of the independent variable categories, and that can't be affected at all by this outcome we're interested in y. So y can't influence x in an experimental setting, which is really cool. And then the other one of these causal hurdles is the one that we've been talking about over and over again in this lecture, which is confounding variables. And because of the random assignment procedure, we have a really high degree of internal validity in the experiment. So we're really sure that we have, because of the random assignment procedure, made sure that confounding variables aren't impacting the relationship we observe between X and Y. And because of this, we're really confident in the causal relationship between X and Y that we find. We're pretty sure that our conclusions about this causal relationship are correct. So experiments really help us with the second and the fourth causal hurdle, and that is part of what makes them so powerful. So if experiments are so great, why would anyone ever do an observational study? Why wouldn't you just do an experiment all the time? Well, the answer is that there are limitations to experiments. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple of these. The first of them is whether we can really assign x, our independent variable, to our subject. So if we're interested in the relationship between x and y, some x variables are not things that we can experimentally manipulate. So if we're interested in how someone's gender affects how they're likely to vote, in an experiment we can't change someone's gender. If we're interested in how someone's race influences uh, their socioeconomic status or their likelihood of having a a promotion in their job or something like that. We can't manipulate race in an experiment. If we're interested in how someone's religion influences voter turnout, we can't uh, manipulate someone's religion in an experimental setting. So depending on the independent variable that we're interested in studying, uh, an experimental approach might not be feasible at all. Also, experiments are really good for studying people when individual people are your unit of analysis. But let's say that you are a scholar who studies things like I study, which are really about uh, the behavior of countries in the international system. Well, I can't experimentally manipulate the characteristics of countries. I can't go to a country like Spain and say, hey, Spain, I'm really interested in the relationship between regime type and your likelihood of going to war. So I've randomly assigned you into a group of autocracies. So if you could just be an autocracy this year, that would be great. I can't do that. I can't experiment on uh, if my unit of analysis is something other than a person. So that's another limitation of the experimental approach. The second big limitation we're going to talk about is whether the experimentation is ethical. So there are things that we can experimentally manipulate that would be unethical to manipulate. So for example, if I wanted to, if I have a research question that has an independent variable that is someone being infected with a particular illness, it's not ethical for me to go around infecting people with a particular illness for the sake of my experiment. 
And then the last limitation we're going to talk about is something called external validity. External validity is how valid our conclusions are, how generalizable our, our conclusions are, outside of the experimental setting. So can I generalize from my experiment to say things about the entire adult population, for example? Or can my experimental findings be generalized to a situation five years from now? Or if I do an experiment on people who live in a particular state, can I generalize those findings to people who live in other states? And also, is the thing that happens in the course of the experiment something that could happen in the real world? So is the stimulus in the experiment something that could happen realistically um, and therefore can be generalized to real world situations? So let's talk about each of those external validity threats a little bit more. So in earlier lectures, we talked about how taking a random sample from the population is something that allows us to make inferences to that whole population based on research on our sample. In experiments, frequently the experimental subjects that we have are not gathered uh, by a random sampling procedure. Usually experiments are done using what's called a convenience sample. So for example, a lot of experiments in social science are done uh, using a population or a sample, sorry, of college undergrads. So these are just students who are on the campus that the researcher is working at and they are the convenient sample for the experiment to be done on. So this is a problem if we want to generalize the whole population and particularly if we think that the effects of the treatment are going to differ based on anything that systematically is different between college undergrads and the general population. So if young people are likely to respond differently to the stimulus in the experiment than older people, or if people with some college education are more likely to respond differently than people with no college education, then the college undergraduate sample that we have is going to be problematic if we're trying to make inferences outside of this experimental setting. So keep in mind this fundamental difference between random assignment and random sampling that we have been talking about since the first week of class. Random assignment in the context of an experiment helps us with internal validity, with making sure that we have pinned down the right causal connection between the two variables that we're looking at. Random sampling is the thing that helps us with external validity, with generalizing from a sample to the whole population. The other big threats to external validity come from the fact that the experimental setting is artificial. So, for example, when subjects are participating in an experiment, they know that they're in an experimental setting. They're not just going about their day-to-day -day lives, and they can be hyper-aware of the fact that their responses, their answers, their behavior, and whatever are being watched. And this is something that we've already talked about, this thing called the Hawthorne effect, where people respond differently when they know that they are being observed. Another threat to external validity from the experimental setting might be that the treatment in the experiment might be too strong or different in a fundamental way from how people would encounter that treatment in the real world. So going back to our campaign ad example, watching a campaign ad in an experimental setting could be a really different experience from just seeing a campaign ad on TV in day-to-day -day life. So for example, if you are in an experimental setting, you're probably really focused on whatever is happening in the experiment. And if the campaign ad is played for you, you might be really tuned in to that ad and paying attention to it um, in a very focused way, you know, picking up on all sorts of details of the ad in a way that you wouldn't be if you just happened to cross a campaign ad when you were watching TV one day. So the strength of that stimulus or the way that you are responding to that particular stimulus of seeing the campaign ad could be really different in the experimental setting and in the real world setting. And then there are also 
uh, a well-studied series of effects that can happen when subjects think that they're in a treatment group and they respond differently as a result of thinking that they're getting a treatment, or if people conducting the experiment treat people in the treatment group differently than they interact with people who are in the control group. Those are all things that can bias the results of an experiment. And frequently, to avoid these effects, we do double-blind studies. So we don't let subjects know if they're in the treatment group or control group, and we don't let people administering the experiment know which group is the treatment group and which group is the control group. So those are the external validity threats, and that's going to wrap up our discussion of research design and experimentation. In the next lecture, we're going to be talking about the other main approach, uh, which is an observational research study. So thank you for tuning in, and I will see you next time.